Let me first preface this presentation with something that I know that all of you, you've always solved whatever conflicts you've had, whether personal or work, with respect and with um, just, you know, being very kind to the other person. Thank you. And um, so if you are here listening to this, I know it's for a friend, and um, this is going to be your lucky day because some of the techniques that we're going to go over are not just applicable to workplace conflicts, but they also may help you in your personal conflicts as well. Not that any of you have those, but just in case. So that alone is worth the price of admission, and hopefully you guys will agree. Okay. Um, I have to be honest with you that my probably default go-to style is trying to avoid conflict at all costs. So this is something that I really have to work on, um, you know, in terms of being comfortable. And you'll see some of the slides we'll talk about. You know, you've got to a lot of times have courage over comfort. And we'll talk about why it's important that you have those building blocks of trust before you can actually get to that point of having that courage over um, that comfort. comfort. So you may wonder what's respectful conflict and what's successful conflict and how can I be involved in a situation that is both respectful and both successful? Well, if I view a successful outcome of a, a conflict situation as it's either my way or it's the highway, then you might as well put up a sign in your office or in your cubicles that says, I'm always right, rule number one, and rule number two, see rule number one. So that, you know, you've got to at least take it that we're going to have to have some compromise at some situation, in some situations, and we're going to have to um, work together. Now, I actually thought that this quote was from Will Rogers or Abraham Lincoln, but it's actually from John Lydgate, who was a poet, and he said, you can please some of the people all of the time, you can please all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. So that, you know, we need to realize that when we're in the workplace, there's always going to be conflict. Um, or there's not going to always be 100% agreement. You, I would think in most operations, um, although not all, you don't want people that are just yes men or yes women. You want people that are going to challenge the status quo. That often happens when you have kind of new people that come in your organization. When we're within the organization, we a lot of times can't see the forest for the trees. But somebody that comes in with a fresh pair of eyes, they can immediately see a better way of doing things. But God help them if they immediately walk in saying, hey, I've got a better way of doing things. So it takes some time to be comfortable, to trust that new organization enough to at least even raise those concerns. And most people, they're not going to handle conflict well. And there's two reasons. The first one, they don't know what to do. And the second one is they don't know what to say. So what do we do in that situation? Nothing. And so that's one of the reasons why, or a couple of the reasons why we would avoid conflict. OK, so let's get into the meat of the presentation. OK, first of all, in terms of just a simple definition, and you guys, I'm sure, have, if you have any kids or if you have teenagers, you've de if you've been a teenager, you definitely know that conflict is going to be um, opposing needs, interests, or views. It can happen between individuals. It can happen between groups. Um, you know, you may have a couple of kids, and they've decided that if they, you know, group together, they can now come and ask, you know, mom or dad for whatever they want and their safety in numbers. Um, and it's also a difference of opinion where the opposing sides really do cling to the position that they've taken or the position that they feel is right. 
and they're unable to reach a consensus. So everybody walks out of the meeting unhappy unless you were the one who actually got your way. Okay, in the context of a work environment, um, let's look at what are some of the reasons that would cause that conflict to be a problem. First of all, it can divide um, people and it, and it can create polarization. So the opposing sides, they each take hard lines, they, the distance continues to widen, and the two sides, uh, the distance between the two sides continues growing as the conflict continues. We're not talking politics, but even on the the political pundits talk about they can't work with somebody from across the aisle. So that's a reference that you physically are sitting on two different sides of an issue. And sometimes even an unspoken um, body language can give off uh, or can, can let people know what you're really feeling inside as opposed to what you're saying. And, you know, so those are things that you need to consider also. Often it can breed hostility, anger, and a negative and an antagonistic um, workplace or work environment. Okay, some of the common causes. And, you know, these I think are pretty much common sense. Poor communication can definitely lead to misunderstandings. We may have different work styles. Um, we, in our office, we're very fortunate that we have flexible work hours. And you can pretty much work from 6.30 in the morning until 6, during that time, 6.30 in the morning until 6.30 at night. Well, some people choose a four-day work week with 10-hour work days. Other people prefer, you know, an 8 to 3.30 schedule. There are some of us who drive in an hour from Hammond, Louisiana on I-12 to Baton Rouge, Louisiana through downtown to actually get to our office. And I either have to be there for 6.30 or wait and come in for 9. And in the afternoons, for it not to take me an hour and a half, I have to wait until 6 or 6.30 to leave and, or leave at you know 2.30 or 3. So when we want to meet with other people within our office, um, we need to, you know, take that into consideration. Well, okay, let me not always schedule my meetings for 5.30 because that's a time that's good for me. Let me look at when, you know, the majority of people in our office that need to essentially attend um, the meeting when they'll be around. Different personalities. We often have different goals and interests where it's not about a we situation as an organization. It's more about the thought of what do I need to do so that my department or my group stands out and is seen as the best in the, um, in the like entity wider within our organization. And I apologize for having to take sips of water, but um, I have issues with allergies, so that's, uh, so I, and I took an allergy pill this morning. Uh, it may make me, my mouth a little drier. I know, too much information. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we all have different, different aspirations or needs. We may have overlapping job functions. Um, in fact, I can give you a really good example of when I first started um, and we were working on the brochure for our first CLGE class. How many of you attended one of our level ones? Awesome. What about a level two? <gasps> Wonderful. So glad that you guys uh, have gotten you know, enough value that you have chosen to come back. But I just assumed since this is a program that was in local government services and I was in charge of the program with needing approval from, um, you know, from the legislative auditor and the first assistant and my director of local government services that when we do the brochure, when we do any marketing materials, anything like that, well, I'll just create what I want and, you know, that'll be fine. Well, um, our, uh, the gentleman that is our head of publishing and that, you know, he knows all the programs. So I had to realize that, oh, wait a minute, I have to work on his timeline and I have to also 
He's not in my department, so my director cannot say, hey, stop everything that you're doing. We've decided that in four weeks we're going to have a CLGE or a Center for Local Government Excellence um, uh, seminar, and so, you know, let's do all the marketing and, and let's get this out to everybody. Or the IT department, that they have to create forms, that they have to create a database. So. Um, that initially caused some issues just in terms of we had to learn we've got to give the IT department more of a heads up, more notice. We've got to give the graphic designers more of a notice or more of a heads up. And then different perceptions about um, situations, about policies, about procedures. And just remember that a person's perception, that that really is their reality. That wall could be black. Some of you may think, mm, that looks a little more gray. Well, when I look at that wall, I see a black wall. But your perception, I may not be able to convince you that that's really a black wall. You may, until you leave here, consider, consider that a gray wall. Um, and it often doesn't matter which real, and Lizzie may consider, oh wait, that's a dark green wall. So we could have three different perceptions. I don't know if any of you remember the um, TV series, I think maybe back in the, the 90s or the 80s, and it was called 30 something. And it was about several couples, several were married, and then they had some single friends. Um, and I've tried to get this clip because it's excellent to show the situation with perception or how it really plays out or can play out. But in one of the first episodes, they show a scene of a party. And the couples and the individuals, they're at this party. And so you see what really happens. Well, the, net, the uh, TV audience, or that you see the next day, as each one of those individuals are remembering that situation, even the married couple, you see how they saw it from their perception. And you see that no two people saw it the exact same way. And since I was the TV audience and actually did get to see it um, from an objective point of view, they all saw it different than what really happened. And that's often how um, you know, our perceptions can cloud what we see or how we feel when something's going on or when we're in um, a conflict situation. Okay, some of the things that we want to consider um, when we're looking at is conflict destructive or is it something that is healthy? First of all, or even something that we need to address maybe on a different level. What's the effect that the situation is having on the parties involved? If it's just kind of friendly banter, and I'll give you an example, my battle last night, I was kind enough to make our dinner reservations for last night at a very nice restaurant. Well, some of us had work to do or wanted to check emails after dinner, so I made our reservations for 5.30 in the afternoon. So I give Mike that information, and he immediately says, oh, are we going to be playing bingo after, or are we getting the early bird special? And I could have taken offense to that had I not had a good relationship and a good working relationship with Mike. And, you know, we just kind of bantered back and forth. And so last night when our dinner took two or two and a half hours, and we did compromise. We ended up going for about six o'clock. But... Um, you know, I said, aren't you glad that we, you know, came to dinner as early as we did so that it's not 10 o'clock when we're heading back to our rooms? I don't know if he ever really agreed with me. He might have, but, um, but it was a good example of having that trust. If we didn't have it, I could have maybe gotten offended. Well, you don't like when I made the reservations? Then guess what? You make the reservations. Or next time you handle, you know, all of the logistics. Um, but we were able to kind of laugh it off and joke about it. And he'll probably joke about it next week at the office with me and, you know, ask how many early bird specials I've been to. Um, okay, the second thing that we want to look at, um, and so Diane doesn't need to get, she's our director for both of us, so she doesn't need to get involved with that. But if it were an uncomfortable situation, if it made other individuals in the group uncomfortable, then that's something when you really need to address it and address it head on. 
Okay, the second thing, is it negatively affecting your mood or the performance in other aspects of the job? Um, do people still show respect for each other? Is the issue between the parties, is it causing stress or um, is it affecting other people's morale? Misery loves company, and you guys all know that the grapevine is, you know, not just a song, or hearing it on, heard it through the grapevine is not just a song, it actually, you know, occurs. And a lot of times that channel of communication, the grapevine, gets started and it just continues rolling, and it's nothing like what the actual situation is or could be. Do t um, teammates and subordinates, do they feel encouraged to speak out? Do they feel that they're not going to get fired if they happen to disagree with somebody that's their supervisor or maybe a more senior colleague? Are there personal issues that actually color the argument? Um, you know, maybe somebody in my family uh, a couple of weeks ago would have said, when I made dinner reservations, oh, I don't, you know, like that restaurant. Oh, I don't want to go at that time. That could still be in the back of my mind, and that could have maybe triggered, you know, a different response um, if I was upset about that to, you know, Mike's um, jokes last night. And then, are there parties that are involved that they're simply differing in their professional opinions? Now, if something is a legal issue, then, you know, we've got to make sure that we don't get in trouble legally in accounting with all of our standards. There are auditing standards, there are accounting standards. These are things that, and as Jennifer will say, if it says shall, it means you absolutely have to do it. So, um, you know, is it just a difference or is that person really trying to keep you out of trouble in some way, shape, or form or keep the organization out of trouble? Okay, conflict, not always destructive. And um, it's, if we can manage it, then it can actually be a positive thing. And let's look at some of um, the reasons why conflict would be, or what, would, what do you guys, can you think of, without looking at the next slide, why would conflict be important at work? Do you see any positives to it? Yes. Yes, most definitely. Uh, it's diversity of thinking is a good positive one and growth. Yes, ma'am. Yes, exactly. Those are two really, um, really good reasons. And let's look at some of the others. And I can't quote you the studies, the year, and, and you know who did the studies and what university, but. Um, Patrick Lencioni, who actually is, um, he does a lot with teams and dysfunctions of teams and how to make teams more functional. And you may want to look up some of his work because some of the tips that I'm going to give you come directly from some of the things that, um, that I've read from him. But um, there's been a lot of, um, of studies that have been done on how do you get employees, the buzzword, there's two buzzwords right now in kind of human resources and you'll hear it even on like the Today Show and you know some of the, the different programs about engagement. How do you get your employees more engaged? Um, I think Charlie Mackles is the one who was talking yesterday about how much turnover they actually are having and how much turnover they see. And their goal is not just to have lower turnover, but they want those that are the most effective teachers and the most effective staff members to be the ones that actually, um, that actually stay. So engagement, the more employees are engaged at work, feel like a part of something, and we'll talk about culture, which, um, culture which actually kind of um, leads into that then the more likely they are when things get tough to at least think before immediately sending out their resume and, and looking for something else. Um, the other word that has been a buzzword, and it seems like just within the last month, it's called quiet quitting, where employees, they used to say employees are disengaged. Now they say it's quiet quitting. Um, and that simply is when you're doing the minimum amount that you need to do to just to get by, to kind of fly under the radar, you know, not to get fired, um, but you're really not 
enjoying your job. You're really not, there's just a lot of other things that you would prefer to be doing rather than work. And I know that you may say, well, work is a job. It's not supposed to be fun. But in the right circumstances, at least your work day in some parts should be fun. So teams that engage in conflict, or if they're not afraid of conflict, then they often have lively and interesting meetings. Because you may have a healthy banter back and forth. You may have somebody that plays the devil, devil's advocate, but in an angelic kind of way. And so that's a good thing. Um, and, you know, we're going to look at the conflict continuum and, you know, where do you want to be and what's destructive and what's healthy. And you would think, well, you know, then avoidance would be the best. We don't have conflict at all. We'll know that can lead to other problems. Some of the other things, you want to involve all team members for their ideas. You all talked about that. Solve real problems quicker. You know, we definitely... Um, can see things from different points of view. I remember when I was at, um, I was taking a graduate class and at this time um, I was probably, let's say 40. I was probably older than that, but let's go with 40. And it was a graduate class and it was right after Katrina. Um, I was living in Hammond and I needed some extra graduate classes to continue teaching management at Southeastern. I wasn't a fan of group projects because I knew in my classes that in group projects, one of the complaints that I always got is that one or two people did the project and the other two just kind of wrote on their coattails. I also knew that I could control what I did and how much effort I put into the project. So when they said a group project, you know, I'm sure I rolled my eyes. And then um, I learned a really good lesson. I had not really worked with PowerPoint a whole lot. Even though I had taught at a university all those years, the PowerPoints and all of this, you didn't have to create it. That was all given to you. So it looked nice and the fonts were right and graphs were in there and um, it, it was pretty easy. Well, we were going to do a presentation, a really big presentation that was a big part of our grade. And in our group, there were probably three or four of us that had at least 20 years of real world work experience um, out you know, in different areas. And so we were able to bring a lot to the table. The class was compensation management. We were able to bring a lot to the table in terms of what we had seen worked and didn't work in that field. Well, the younger and the 20 somethings that were in our group, their forte was putting the presentation together. And boy, did we have a good presentation. And we got a really good grade on that presentation. And I know if I had had to do that PowerPoint and those things that I wasn't good at, spreadsheets, things like that, if I had had to do that back at that time, I had never had any of that. When I was in college, we didn't even have computers or personal. We had computers, not personal computers. You took computer science and programming computers. There was no... Um, office suite and learning database management and, and any of that kind of stuff. So that really showed me that when you can get varying backgrounds and varying points of view that you definitely can come up with a much better solution. Also, um, they often are able to minimize politics and to say, okay, there's a lot of noise that's out there in the organization, but let's just deal with what we know is real. They can put critical topics on the table for discussion. They can be innovative. And also, and this is where when we talked about engagement, it comes in, they have higher engagement and their interaction can be more fun. I really do like the individuals that I work with. And during part of the pandemic, we, most of us worked from home 100% of the time. I was very glad I missed the interaction that I had, whether it was in the break room or just, you know, seeing individuals just kind of, you know, laughing, hearing somebody in our different cubicle section say something funny that, you know, was a nice interaction. And it definitely, um, and that's definitely something that you miss when you're dealing with remote um, teams. Also, who knew that work could be fun? Well, that's what, you know, we, we want to, we spend so much time at work that we really do want to be able to make it a place that people are not dreading to go to on a Monday morning or whatever day they come into the office. Okay, where are we going to start? 
Um, Okay, this is not conflict training, so don't go tell anybody that you had conflict training because I'm saying right here, don't start with conflict training. So we're going to look at some of the issues in terms of how we def define it, but it's not going to be a you do this, you say this. These are just things that I want you to think about. One of the things that you have to do before you start telling or, or suggesting to your employees that they engage in healthy, productive conflict is you've got to make sure that in your organization that your, that your organization culture allows for conflict and that it's something that is embedded within your organization. You're able to embrace it. Now, I do not mean yelling and screaming at each other down the hall. Um, I personally have not ever been involved in a work situation that involved that or that I was close to other people in the organization having that, that type of engagement. That would make me very uncomfortable. So it's not that type of conflict when we talk about it. It is definitely more on how can we be more um, collaborative. In terms of what is organizational culture, again, this is a buzzword that's really popular these days. And it's the collection, it's the values, it's the expectations that we have, it's the practices that we have that actually guide and inform the actions of all of the team members. It essentially, your organizational culture lets you know, how am I supposed to behave when I'm here at work? How am I supposed to act within the organization? And Mike has talked about tone at the top. I think Charlie Mackles talked about tone at the top. We've heard a lot about tone at the top in terms of internal controls. Well, we've also got essentially tone at the top or whoever is the leader or leaders in our organization um, that will be the ones that essentially are defining this culture. And it's communicated to us and reinforced through different methods. Through, um, and it shapes our perceptions. It shapes our behavior. It lets me know, am I going to be understood on this situation? Or is it going to be a situation where um, it's not going to be a good situation for me if I disagree with anybody? Um, if, if any of you, if you all were here yesterday when Mike Wagaspak, you know, just talked about our organization, um, one of my colleagues very recently made the comment that it just seems like things are more fun. People are happier at work. And she said, do you all, you know, do you feel the same way? Are you seeing the same things that I am? And my response is, I definitely am. Our office is not as rigid. We are still regulators and there are still things that we have to do, but it's not as rigid as what it may have been in the past. Um, I was not at the office, but I've heard stories that, and this was not our previous auditor, this was many auditors back, that he would stand outside, and I don't know how he had time to do this, he would stand outside and if he saw, um, if somebody came in late, he wanted you to write down and let the office uh, and let him know why you felt like that you were privileged and you could come in late. So not really sure what he was doing with the rest of his time if he had the time to do that. Um, but Mike has also said that and he, and he um, iterated this to us when he very first when he got there in the very early days. Um, and even in his interview with the committee, the legislative committee that um, was selecting somebody to take over for Dow Prepara, that he wanted us to be not a, not a gotcha type of organization. He wanted us to be trusted advisors. If you look on the new website that we now have, in all of Mike's um, talks when he speaks to people, his goal is that we're trusted advisors. He even made a comment that, because Mike was a sheriff, so he was an entity that essentially dealt with our organization. He's also an auditor, so he did governmental audits. So he knows from all different sides um, what the, essentially how we were viewed. And he said that there were times when if he had questions, he would say, oh, I don't know if I want to call the auditor because then they're going to know that we have a particular question and they might, you know, get me for this or they may ding me or they may send their investigative team to come and find out what's going on. So 
his goal is really that we're trusted advisors. And that makes me a lot more comfortable in, in working for this organization, that we want you all to see us as people that you can turn to. And all of the training that we've done thus far and that we're continuing to do is so that you know you have somebody that you can call and that we can help you through um, things and through different situations. Okay, values. What's your principle? What's your standard of behavior? What is it that's important to me? Importance to me may be making all of the money that I can. Importance to you may be I want to make a decent living, but I also want to be able to pick my kids up at school at 3 o'clock. Um, and so we may have different things that are valuable. Do you value trust? Do you value honesty? Do you value collaboration? Do you like working in groups? Do you value integrity or autonomy? Do, are you much better working alone? And values, again, are at the heart of the organizational culture. And so you want to understand the values that are important to each of the team members that you work with. And, take, and keep that in mind as you're dealing with different situations within the workplace. Expectations, that's another part of, of uh, an organization's culture. And conflict, that's both healthy and productive. It's going to look at concepts. It's going to look up ideas or look at ideas. And the goal is going to be, what's the best possible solution? Not, oh, can I get my way in this, um, in this situation that we're in or in this meeting that we're in? Or am I really interested in seeing what's going to be best for my organization in the long run? It also, define, it also demands that there's a culture of respect in our organization. And um, what is respect in terms of the concept of the work environment? It's esteem for others. It's accepting differences even when you disagree. Uh, honoring others, treating them as you would like to be treated. I think there's a book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And part of that is treat others the way you'd like to be treated. And then being considerate of others in the workplace, behaving courteously towards them, behaving in a professional manner. It plays a um, crucial role in creating a workplace that is comfortable for us, that's productive, and that we ultimately view as fair. It's also going to be an essential ingredient when we're looking at trying to resolve conflict. It's going to be the catalyst that's actually going to let our differences be negotiated. And again, we want to reach a mutually satisfactory outcome. Not just my way or your way, but what's going to be best um, for us overall. <clears throat> Connection is also a goal in healthy and respectful and productive conflicts. Um, it's the energy that's going to exist between people when you feel seen, heard, and valued, when you can give and receive feedback and ideas without fearing judgment, and you essentially are getting strength from that relationship. It's somebody that you can share things with that um, you know are going to stay between the two of you. And what you want to look at as you exit a situation where there may have been conflict and if you're trying to think, was that healthy or not, you want to look at, is there more connection than what we um, had when we actually began? So this is your first tip. You want to normalize healthy, respectful, productive conflict, and you want to make it part of your organizational culture. You want to make it a safe place for conflict. We can disagree, but I don't want my first thought to be, I'm sending my resume out because I'm going to get fired immediately. You want to have at least the trust that, okay, I can disagree with Diane. She will listen to my point of view. She still gets to make the ultimate decision, but she's going to be respectful of me and of my opinions. And even if she doesn't choose to go the route that I you know, think is better or is best, I know that she listened, and if I believe that she listened and heard me, it is so much easier for me to accept the route that she may be taking us down in the future. Uh, I think I may have mentioned the conflict continuum, and <clears throat> the ideal point, what we're striving for um, and what's best for the organization is that we're going to get to 
the ideal conflict point that's healthy, productive conversations amongst us. Something that is based on trust. Did this conflict result in people feeling seen? Did they feel heard? And did they feel valued? Not whether you thought they felt that way, but did that person actually feel that way? Um, and could they give and receive feedback? Or sometimes we don't like the word feedback, so let's use the word insight. Could they do that without actually being judged? Um, and if you look at, you can go too far to the other end. We all know destructive conflict and the things that it can do doesn't feel respectful. We walk away feeling very tiny and, and not feeling good about the situation. That, at its worst, results in mean-spirited personal attacks. Essentially, when that happens, trust is being damaged. You did this, you did this, you are responsible for this. That can be very destructive and that can shut down people speaking up at any time or any point in the future. But that other end of the continuum can also be unhealthy or can also be disruptive or destructive within your organization, and that's if you avoid conflict. Nobody's saying anything, there's artificial harmony. So you think that, oh, these employees that I've just hired, they've been with me for several months, I don't have to worry that they're gonna start looking for another job because everybody seems to like me. They like my organization, they haven't said anything negative. And then all of a sudden you walk in and you have 10 resumes on your desk. So that was simply artificial harmony. They did not feel comfortable that they could disagree with anything. And so that can be just as, um, just as, as bad. Now, teams that avoid conflict, they often have boring meetings. Um, and they often feel like it's a waste of time and energy. They also feel like it's a, worst of, a waste of time and energy. So um, you may think, oh, we could have done this all by email. They also ignore controversial topics that may be crit um, critical. We talked about the grapevine and the problems with that um, and gossip within your organization. And then they fail to tap into the perspectives of all team members. Okay, what, what would be some of the ways, why might I want to avoid conflict at work? Or even in a personal situation? Because it's uncomfortable. Most definitely. Most definitely. For me to engage in this, whether it's in a personal situation or in a work situation, I'm going to feel vulnerable. I have to realize that I'm going to be uncomfortable, but I don't want to feel that my safety is being, being damaged. You can choose courage over comfort. You don't ever want to choose courage over your own mental health or, or psychological safety. So being vulnerable, there's going to be uncertainty, there's going to be risk, there's going to be emotional exposure. I thought that this was very interesting, and I am not a doctor, I do not play one on TV, so I can't tell you what part of the brain um, is being lit up there. But when you experience physical pain, the shoes that you have on are too tight for your feet, or the heel's too high, or you're not comfortable, there's a part of your brain that's recognizing that. Well, when you feel social pain, there also are physiological things that happen. And this essentially is when they looked at what does your brain do if you're involved in uncomfortable conflict. Um, sub such things as you're not feeling included, you're not feeling like you're part of a team. Thinking about when you know you were uh, eighth graders, when they're going to go up and ask a girl to dance, you know you have to be very vulnerable. And the feelings that you get if you're turned down. So um, it can be very painful. And look at between the social pain and the physical pain, these were, actual, these were actually brain scans that were done. And look how close those two are. And the top one is the situation of, of conflict at work, and then the bottom is just experiencing physical pain. Physical pain. Um, we talked about courage over comfort. If I don't feel safe within my organization, in terms of that I can take a risk, then that's psychological safety, and that could definitely be um, a situation where it's not courage over safety. If I'm a mother of five children, I'm a single mother, and I absolutely positively need this job, I need this income, even if I were out of work for a couple of days, it would 
very negatively affect, um, you know, maybe my living situation or my kids. I don't have, that's true psychological safety, that I can't take a risk. I cannot risk that I may say something that somebody doesn't like and I get fired. I don't have that, um, that is essential chance to be able to do that. So you never want to choose courage over safety. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. It's not okay for you to feel unsafe in, in, unsafe in the situation. And not even to that degree, but can I engage in conflict without being judged? Um, if not, then it may not be safe to do it. Or if I've done it one time and all I saw was people rolling their eyes every time I say something, then um, I may not ever do it again. Okay, to get respectful, productive conflict, you need to create a safe environment. And you need to have an expectation that there will be and there should be some tensions on your team. Not to where people can't work together, but at least to where we're trying to recognize what's best for our organization as a whole, not just me or my department. Um, so you need to create, I'm sorry. Um, and there are a number of different models that you could look at in terms of um, what produces the best results for the organization, which is the top of the pyramid where we're trying to get. And if you look, um, they all have trust as the largest and the biggest base. That's what everything is built on. And to be able to engage in that healthy conflict or to feel comfortable with it, you have got to have already established some base of trust with the individuals that are involved. Okay, tip number two, to experience and maintain productive and respectful conflict, which is what we're striving towards, then what's best for our organization is also what we're striving for. We need a strong foundation of trust. There are seven behaviors that actually um, encourage trust. Boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault, integrity. I'm going to give you just some quick um, information about each of these. But boundaries, respecting other people's boundaries. If I'm unsure about whether I can approach you or maybe even approach you at this time, if you see somebody stressed, not the best time to, to um, approach them about a situation that may be a bit of a disagreement. So respect those. Reliability. Do I do or do the others in your organization do what they say they will? Do um, we take ownership within our organization for our mistakes? Do we apologize for them? When Do we try to maybe make amends and, and make it up to somebody that we may have hurt inadvertently? Um, a vault. When somebody tells me something, can I count on them to actually be truthful with me? Um, and do I not pass it on to other individuals? Integrity, choosing courage instead of comfort, doing what's right, um, not just what's easy or fun, non-judgmental. Can people ask us different things? Can they tell us how they really feel, not just what we think that um, they want to hear without actually judging that person? And then I think this one is, is one of my favorites in terms of um, what is what can be most helpful is generosity and that doesn't mean that I'm going to pick up the tab I did not pick up the tab for everybody last night at uh, our dinner and so it's not that type of generosity but it's actually generosity in terms of our interpret our interpretations give somebody the benefit of the doubt um, you know before immediately seeing oh well they just said that because they don't like me Stop to think what, you know, kind of are some of the reasons for it and give them the doubt for their um, words and actions. Um, you guys can read through. I put a lot more on, my, on the slides than what I'm able to get to because I think that the information is important. But for us to have trust, we've got to trust somebody's character. And in the workplace, we've got to know that they're competent, that they can do their job, that I can rely on them um, to do that job. Also, say what you mean, mean what you say. Essentially, the clearer we can be, then we're being kinder to people within the workplace. Another tip, tip number four. Consider, I think it's number four. Consider the level of trust in the relationship. Is this something that it's a character issue? Is it competence? Is it both? Be as clear as you can. Be as kind as you can. And remember that in a conflict situation, it may not be that 
um, your friend left their cap off of the toothpaste and you blow up, it may be that um, you know, they've been ugly to you for the last six months. Or you know, 10 years ago, they said something and you didn't like it. You never said anything about it. And, um, and so that has eroded that trust. Do we, or are we assertive, or are we cooperative? How do we come together, and what's our, um, what's our fallback um, when we're in these types of situations? There's actually, if you guys want to know how in meetings or in situations, how, where do I fall in terms of being assertive or unassertive, cooperative or uncooperative, this Thomas Kilman instrument, and there are a lot of others that you can go to that are free, um, on the webs on different websites, it'll let you know what's my do what's my default um, feelings in terms of with conflict or even in in situations with other people. We also, as a team, can agree we're not going to engage in unhealthy and disrespectful behaviors during conflict. Some of the unhealthy behaviors: uh, definitely saying things that you're going to regret. Um, you never want to be in that situation. And guess what? In today's world where things are recorded and especially in our governmental situations where a lot of things are public records, you've got to be very, very careful. Um, becoming overly dramatic, gossiping, dwelling on wounded relationships, glossing over problems and essentially not really bringing up what the true nature of it is. You don't speak up about your own needs but then you walk around being mad and with your head down all day because you didn't get what you wanted but you never told anybody what you were hoping for. Um, caves in to avoid tension, retreats from the conflict, avoids emotional situations, um, overpowers with logic and facts. Becoming passive aggressive is probably the one that um, a lot of times we see most often. Um, gentlemen um, or ladies, if your spouse's significant other or friend says, you ask, how are you doing? And they say, fine. I hope that you all realize that really is not fine. So that's very passive aggressive and, um, you know, and you need to get to what's the heart of the matter. Um, and then overpowers and gets aggressive, you know, that can definitely lead to serious situations in the workplace. Healthy behaviors, address the issues head on, express how you're feeling, show empathy and feel for the other person's point of view. Listen to their point of view, um, try to, to de-escalate when things actually do build up. Um, look at logic, look at object, object, excuse me, objectivity. Stick up for your own rights. Don't just be a pushover if you really feel that something's important or something's going to be unhealthy for the organization as a whole. And then speak up about your problems. And the last two slides really go through practical steps that you can take to actually resolve those conflicts with respect. And you can refer to these, but I strongly um, suggest that you go through and read these and think about is this kind of how our organization functions? And are these things that we're currently doing or maybe we want to do in the future? And you, know, it may, you can maybe bring these up to your supervisor and get kind of agreement that this is how we're gonna ha handle conflict in the future. Um, and discussing ways to prevent unhealthy conflict, implement suggestions, encourage compromise, and again, remember, it's not my way but the highway, there usually is a healthy middle. Two sides of a pancake and the you know right or two sides of the truth and there's usually your side, my side and the real truth. So thank you guys. Um, hopefully this is information that will help. There are a couple of things that, um, a couple of slides that I meant to put in and I'm actually going to send those out to you all because it is more steps and concrete things that you can go through when you find yourself involved in an unhealthy situation. Thank you, guys.